Philippians chapter 2 and verse number, uh, look at verse number 4. We finished there last time. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so it's important, and I mentioned last time, it's important that, um, that we as God's people uh, not always put ourselves first. Um, and, and, and you say, what is that? Now listen, I wanted to put a stipulation on that, and I didn't get to talk about it uh, last, last time too much. But I learned this, okay? If you're a giver and you try to put people first, Jesus first, others second, you last, joy, amen, the acronym that we, we mentioned, or is that an acrostic? I forget. I always get those confused. But um, anyway, J-O-Y, here's what will happen sometimes. You'll run into, and it's thank God it's not always the, uh, the rule, but it, I found it's the exception to the rule. Some people are takers. Does that surprise some of you? You might be a giver and you run into a taker. You have to learn when to set limits and when to say enough is enough. And that doesn't make you a bad person or that, and that doesn't, that keeps you from being taken advantage of. I, I've told you the story before of an older gentleman that taught me something. He said, Jason, I consider you my friend. I think I asked him for money one time uh, and he was an older Christian man and I had every intention of paying him back and I did end up paying him back. And I was very young. I, I, I don't even think I was 18 at the time. And uh, his wife was responsible for me to go into church. And, and he said, Jason, he said, I want to tell you something. He said, I'm going to give you this. But he said, I want you to use me as a friend, but don't abuse me. Okay? And that was very, a very good bit of wisdom that I learned. Because you'll learn that there's takers in this world. And this is something that you have to learn a balance on. And you say, what is that? Because some takers have no limit to what they will take from you emotionally, spiritually, and financially. And you have to say, enough is enough. Okay? At times. And you have to recognize that this person is abusing your friendship, they're abusing your Christianity, and they're taking advantage of you because they, maybe they're not mature enough, maybe they're lost, I don't know the case, but you have to learn when to set limits. You have to learn, and this is something I learned way late in life. <laughs> and I've had to learn this probably in the last four or five years. But there, to, to keep your relationship with the Lord right, you have to say, okay. And sometimes it takes counsel. And the multitude of counselors, their safety. And you have, may have to counsel with somebody else and say, listen, pastor, um, this happened to me. And, and I've loaned this person money three, four times. And they haven't paid me back yet. Should I keep loaning them money? Is it the Christian thing to do to keep doing that? That's an easy one. No. They lied to you once. They lied to you twice. They lied to you three times. And they're coming again the fourth time. Bad idea. You see? And you're not the bad guy because you say no. You're not a bad guy because you put limits on things. Are we okay tonight? I'm not preaching any false doctrine here. I'm just telling you that you have to learn not to be taken advantage of. Now, there's a difference between, listen, I know when I'm being taken advantage of, and I have to use wisdom, and you do too, to how far you let that go, <laughs> okay? And, and here's what I mean by that. If somebody comes to you and you think it's a Christian thing to do um, to help somebody, and maybe you're in that case where you've loaned them money three times and they haven't paid you back and have no intention to, and they still don't treat you like a real friend, they only come around or call when they need something. It starts to get suspicious, you see? And then you have to learn when to put a draw a line in the sand, if you will, and say, okay, I'm, I, I, you know, the Lord, then the Lord, to be honest with you, if you pray about it, the Bible says to pray about everything, doesn't it? You pray, and Lord, give me wisdom in this. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. If you put yourself in a bad financial position, if you can't give something to somebody and not worry about it, you shouldn't be giving it. If you've got to take money out of your rent to, to pay somebody else's bills because they're neglectful or something's going wrong in their life, and then it's going to put you in a bad position, that's not a good idea. Because your landlord's going to come around and then it's going to be a bad testimony on you. And here's the thing. You might be bailing out somebody that God's trying to teach them a lesson. And you've rescued them from God's um, hand of punishment. And you don't want to get between God and Him punishing His children and disciplining His children. 
Because why? They need to be driven to their knees to find the, the assistance from God and not be bumming money from everybody or doing that. You understand? I hope you're okay tonight. You have to learn to set healthy boundaries. Right? Now this, this is just something that's common sense. Um, look at Philippians. This is something I've never one time heard this preached. I've never heard this preached. Not in my entire life. Um, maybe I have and I was too stupid to remember it or uh, don't recall it. But I haven't, haven't heard this much. Look at Philippians. Um, uh, let's see here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. Here's what, <laughs> here's what happens. Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. You say, why do you put this warning on us, Pastor? Why do you say set healthy limits? Verse 21, Philippians 2, 21. For all seek their, what? Own. <laughs> men, men, women, boys, and girls are selfish. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And so you have to learn, just like with children, just like with children, you have to learn to let them fall at times, and you have to let them learn to live with the consequences of bad decisions. Because if you rescue them constantly, the Bible says, if thou deliver... And I can't remember the cross-reference. I could pull it up in a moment, but I didn't write it down. I meant to tell you tonight. If you deliver a man, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, you'll have to do it again. You believe the Bible? I won't turn to the reference, but um, you'll look, you can look it up. If thou deliverest him, thou will have to do it again, the Bible tells you. And so just, just be careful that you don't get into a pattern... Of doing that, okay? Because I put myself in in bad situations um, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And and you know what? Uh, a proper English word that you need to learn how to use is God's people. No. No. Can I borrow five hundred dollars? No. See how easy that was. But, but I see that you've got this and you've got that. and No. You don't have to give them an explanation why. You don't have to explain your banking history, your work situation. Just because another brother or sister comes to you and asks you to do something for them does not immediately obligate you because you are a brother or sister in Christ to do it and to, do, and to help them in, because you might not be helping them at all. The Bible says the heart of the righteous studieth the answer. One, one thing to do, you might, you might be, the, the Holy Spirit and your mind may be saying no and screaming it. And you may need some time. You know what you have to learn to do? The heart of the righteous studieth the answer. Sometimes you know what you need to do? You need to say, let me pray about it and get back to you. And you say, go pray about it. Seek some counsel. Seek some counsel. The first church where I got saved in, there was a man there that turned up at church. And he was the, my Sunday school's teacher's brother-in-law. And so he was automatically in a trusted position because of his um, relationship to the Sunday school teacher. I was working at the time. I was a young man, about 16 years old, and um, had, a, had a good business mowing grass and doing landscaping work. And this fella came to me and I thought he was, you know, I'm Christian and I'm trying to do the right thing. I'm zealous. And this man says, hey, can I borrow $200? Back then, that was a lot of money. In 1998, that was a lot of money to a 16-year-old kid. But I thought this is the Sunday. I didn't ask counsel of the Lord. I didn't ask counsel of my Sunday school teacher. I just whipped it out and gave it to him. And four, five, six, he said, I'll pay you back next week. Four, five, six, seven weeks went by. And you say, what did it do? It affected my spirit towards him in church because he didn't—he lied to me and didn't pay it back. I asked him about it, and he shuffed it off and didn't say anything. And I finally went to the Sunday school teacher's wife, and it was her brother. Uh, his, and I, I asked him, asked her, I said, hey, you know, so your brother, he borrowed some money off. Of him. I didn't want to mention it. And she went like this, oh, Jason, you should have come to me or Randy and let us know. He's borrowed money off about 10 people in the church and he hasn't paid anybody back. You see? And if I were to use wisdom, I never got my money back. 
He was a, de <laughs> he was a degenerate. And you say, what is that, a gambler? Um, messed up with drugs? And, and you say, what did he do? He took my money and probably drugged it away or drank it away or did something else with it, and he never paid me back or anybody else. And you say, what you should you have done? You should have asked counsel. Listen, in the church, somebody does that, you ought to just say, hey, pastor, what do you think about this? What's your counsel on this? Because you don't know five other people that may have already come to me and talked to me. Somebody's come to me before and they wanted to, to give an amount of money to somebody and, and they were just asking what my counsel was on it. These people were backstabbing, hurting the church, and about to try to split the church. And I told that brother, I said, I don't think this is a good idea. You say, why? They're, they're benefiting off of this faithful brother in church while they're trying to split the church wide open and hurt the church. So I said, I don't think it's a good idea. Within two weeks, three weeks, they were gone. And they had got about three or $4,000 out of the church, this church right here. And you say, what'd they do? They came here to get money. And then once they got it and the well went dry, they left. Some of you are real uncomfortable right now. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to minister to you to use some wisdom and get some counsel and pray before you make decisions, before you tell somebody, yes, you know it's going to be to your own hurt to go help somebody move. Now, if you can go and you can go help them, maybe you're not physically able. I had to learn a long time ago, about 10 years ago, because my physical broke down where I can't lift things like I, I used to. And I'm not as strong as I used to be. And as soon as I go help somebody move, I end up hurting myself. And it takes weeks, if not months, for me to get over it because <laughs> I've got problems with my back. And so I got no business trying to lift a lounge and twist and get it upstairs like I used to when I was young. And so you know what I have to learn to do? And it, it grieves me, but I have to say, no, I, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I can't help you with that. And I'd love to. You have to use wisdom, okay? Sorry, I didn't mean to get into all that, but here we are. I'm wanting to get into good stuff, but maybe somebody needed to hear that tonight. Amen. That's that verse. Um, somebody put it up there. Proverbs 19, 19. A man of, of great wrath shall suffer punishment. If thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. And that's Proverbs 19, 19. Uh, if you want to write the reference down. If you deliver him, you'll have to do it again. All right. So Philippians chapter 2. Am I out of time? I got three minutes. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. You glad to be in church tonight, amen? Get you some practical teaching, amen? Not deep doctrinal stuff, just good day-to-day -day practical teaching from the Word of God. Amen. And um, the, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee wisdom in all things. Boy, I, I used to get so bored and annoyed at Dr. Ruckman when I was down there for four years under his teaching and preaching in school because he'd get off into a story and be telling a story about something I thought... Oh, I've heard this before. And he had so much wisdom in those stories that are still helping me to this day that maybe didn't necessarily come from the Bible, but they taught a biblical truth or a biblical principle. And, and now I, I, I grab a hold of those things and I relish them and I thank God for them because they've helped me out of a many a jam. Amen. Uh, so Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to give me a few minutes here. Let's take a few minutes to get into it. And let's read Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So as we read here, verses um, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, down through there, they declare the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And it, it talks about, the pa this passage des describes the two natures of Jesus Christ. It des describes his two. And so in verse 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this mind that in the, in the scriptures there is plainly and clearly referring to the attitude with which Jesus Christ had towards service and obedience. And that's taught by the text because he's trying to teach you. The Apostle Paul is trying to teach the church. And he's trying to teach the Philippians to let this mind be in you. Let this attitude be in you that Jesus Christ had. And what was that? That was the attitude of being a servant. Amen. And um, you, you want to see that again? That was in verse 7 and 8, what we read there. Uh, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. Then we'll come right back there. 
Back to your left, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 and verse 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. The mind of Christ. The Bible says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, that, but we have the mind of Christ. You know what you have access to? And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying in, in Philippians chapter 2. You have right now inside of you, you have the capability. Why? Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so, you know, at every turn, at every situation, when you want to have the right attitude, you know what you can do? Um, and I know it's cliche and it's, you have to watch it, but years ago they had those little bracelets. What would Jesus do? <laughs> WWJD, you know, and people were, at least they did when I was a kid anyway, uh, 20 years ago, um, and, and they, would, they would put those bracelets on, and uh, you say, what is that? When you come up against a situation and you want to have the right attitude, it says here, you have the mind of Christ. The Apostle Paul re reminds us to have the right attitude. Let this mind be in you. So you say, what is that? The mind is already there. It's trying to get out. The Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is within you. And He's always trying to get His will across. Amen? He's trying to have His way. We sing the song, Let Him have His way with thee. Amen? His power can make you what you ought to be. His love can cleanse your heart and make you see. T'was best for Him to have His way with thee. T'was best for him to have his way with thee. Let him have his way with thee. See how it says, let this mind be in you. It's already there. It's already within you. You just got to back off and yield to the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, what's that attitude going to be? It's going to be the attitude of a servant. It's going to be the attitude of a servant. Amen. And so in Philippians chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 16, you see the same thing. He's referring to his attitude of being a servant. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Amen. That is a powerful verse. In the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So the first thing I see is Christ is not only the form of God... He is the image of God. He's the image of God. Look at one. Uh, look at Hebrews chapter one, verse two. Hebrews chapter one, verse two. Hebrews chapter one, verse two. If you'll bear with me, I, I just want to give you a few things from this text. Some really exciting things that I see here, and that we we can be encouraged about our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is not only the form of God; He's the image of God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory. Now, who's the subject here? Look at the first verse and the first word. God. Amen who being the brightness of His glory and the express, verse 3, express image of His person. Who is the person of God? It's Jesus Christ. And the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power. When He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. He's the image of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, In whom, um, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them, which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. What is it? Who is the what? Image of God should shine unto them. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Isn't that a blessing? Jesus Christ is the image of God. Look at Colossians. Is that not enough for you? Keep going. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I like what Jesus Christ said to uh, Philip, and uh, he said, he said, Jesus, in John 14, he said, Jesus, show us the Father. And he said, Philip, have I been so long with you, and you haven't known the Father? He said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Whew. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So the Bible says God the Father, he's invisible. <laughs> he's invisible. And you say, who's his image? What does he look like? He looks like Jesus Christ. He's the image of God. So I can't wrap my mind around it. Join the crowd. <laughs> I, can't, I can't figure that out. Uh, the Bible says um, it's a great mystery. Amen. Um, he was not only equal with God, uh, but he claimed some, several of the same things. We'll just look at a few things and then we'll finish tonight. Uh, look at Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. You got to rest there a little bit in the beginning. We didn't turn too many Bible turn to too many passages, so I'll give you a few here before we go home. Amen. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. He was not only equal with God, like the Bible says, but he claimed the same title as God. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The Bible says, For unto us a child is born, for unto, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. I'm waiting for Christ's government. Amen. Sick of this government, but I'm ready for the Lord's government. Amen. For unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor. What shall he be called? The Mighty God. Amen. That's our Lord. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice, from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You sick of this government? You wait, and you ought to pray for the Lord to come back and get us out of here, amen, and to meet the Lord in the air, because when he sets up his government, there shall be no end. And it's going to be justice, it's going to be right, and it's going to be true. Amen? So he claimed the same title. Amen? But he had the same title. Look at Matthew 26 and verse 64. Not only did he have the same title, he had the same power. Amen? Matthew chapter number 26. First book of your New Testament, Matthew 26. Hang in there with me. Just a few more passages and we'll be through. Amen? Matthew chapter number 26. He claimed the same power. Matthew 26 and verse 64. The Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 64, Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall you see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. You say, who made that prophecy? That's God. <laughs> That's God. He's got the same power as God. And so he's got the same title, the same power. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 13. He's got the same attributes. John chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and look at verse 13. John chapter 3 and verse 13. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 13, And no man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. You see, what is that? Omnipresent. He said, I'm in heaven right now. But they was looking at him right, here, right there on earth. But he was in heaven. But he was on the earth. Only God can do that. Amen? 
omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. What do you think the Bible says? The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. You can pull those shades. You can close your eyes. You can try to erase that history on your computer. And God sees it. He knows. That's why this, this idea about Santa Claus. He knows when you've been naughty. He knows when you've been nice. It's given the attributes of God. He doesn't. God does. Amen. He's got the same authority. Look at Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew 25 verse 31. Matthew 25. He's got the same authority. He's got the same attributes. He's got the same authority. Matthew 25 and verse 31. He's got the same authority. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Verse 32. And before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from the other, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Amen? You say, what's He going to do? He's got the same authority. He's got the same authority as God. He's got the same attributes, the same power, the same title. The Bible said He's equal. He's equal with God. And He's got the same nature. Look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse number 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 that He's got the same nature as God. Same nature. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16. The Bible says in Colossians 1, 16, For by Him, Jesus Christ, for by Him were all things created. Who created all things? Jesus Christ. That are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers or... All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. How about that? John chapter 1 and verse 1. I know you know this text, but man, it's good to look at. Be reminded, John chapter 1 and verse 1. The Bible says there, John chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word... And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? Look at, look at uh, verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. By what? By the Word that was God. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Look at verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 and Acts 20 and verse 28. And then we'll be finished. Acts 20, 28 and 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. I know it's quick going through here, but uh, these are all familiar passages. Just a little shot in the arm, pardon the pun, to encourage you. <laughs> 1, uh, one uh, Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, we'll look at first. You say, he's got the same uh, title, same power, same attribute, same authority, same nature. And he was God manifest in the flesh. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy... You say, what's controversy? That's something you argue over. That's something that's controversial. That's something that, oh, it may be this way, it may be that way. you got this many people and that many people. You know one of the most controversial things on this planet and in the Christian faith is the Trinity. It's God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. All the new Bible versions pervert this verse. Every one of them pervert this verse. You say, Why? What God says is not controversial to the world. They make it controversial. And God said it's not controversial. The Bible says here in the Word of God, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God 
was manifest in the flesh. You say, when did that happen? Jesus Christ, when He showed up. Amen? Manifest in the flesh, just like we read in John 1.14, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory, Acts chapter number 1. Amen? Now, and not only was He God manifest in the flesh, the Bible says that His blood was God's blood. Acts chapter 20, and look at verse number 28. You better write this verse down. You better underline it. You better circle it. You better mark it in your Bible. You say, why? It's going to come up. If you do any personal work, um, look at verse 28, and I'm finished for tonight. Acts 20, 28. And I know I went 15 minutes over. I apologize. Just too excited to let this go. Amen. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which He hath purchased with His own blood. Who did? God. That was Jesus Christ. God manifest in the flesh purchased you with His own blood. Say, what is that? Leaves John MacArthur out in the cold as a fool with egg on his face and most likely lost. I like John MacArthur, you say. You need to get better heroes. Because he said the blood of Christ makes no difference. It's not important at all. Well, you fool. That's what he purchased the church of God with. With his own blood. If you see him, tell him I said so. On God's authority. You say, well, what else does that leave out in the cold? That leaves the Muslim out in the cold. God's got blood. They can't process that. The Bible said that he does. Do you believe the Bible or do you believe some... I won't even tell you what I think about, about that stuff over there. What about the Jehovah's false witness? Where does that leave them? In trouble. Amen. All right, we'll stop right there. All right, any questions tonight? I know we went over, over time there, but maybe you got a question.